Hey, welcome back to the channel. Billy, Gym City Welding. On today's episode, we're gonna talk about MIG welding and plasma cutting 101. Answering some of those questions for all of you at home who don't know how to get started with basic welding and plasma cutting hand tools. Plus, we're gonna do a very special builder spotlight, which you don't wanna miss, and answering some viewer questions from the last couple episodes. All that and more on this episode. Stay tuned. Okay, for this builder spotlight, it's a very, very special one for me. Uh, this gentleman is, uh, I consider a friend and he's a huge mentor to a lot of us in the uh, low riding world who wanna do the best that we can for our cars. And uh, this gentleman would be none other than Brent Greer. Uh, Brent is a, a master craftsman, a, a fabricator extraordinaire, um, one of the best welders I've ever seen. I mean, the guy can do it all. Um, Brent's been around the game for a long time. He's built so many cars over the years, it's not even funny. Um, just a couple ones I could think of right off the top of my head would be his Monte Carlo. Uh, the Monte Carlo was absolutely amazing. Had a big, in a big inch motor and uh, a hot setup for a street car. I mean, it just the thing would bang the bumper all day. Um, he's also had his hands on a few other cars over the years. Um, another one would be an example is this Regal. Um, this was just a street car that uh, he helped put together that would, you know, big inches street car. It's just absolutely amazing work and craftsmanship. Um, Brent is the owner of Pipple Hydraulics. Uh, he makes hydraulic components, suspension components, and 58 to 64 Impala rear ends. Uh, I'm very proud to say that I actually have a Pipple rear end in my car, and uh, I'll post a picture of the video right here. You can go back and watch that episode if you like when I took a road trip down to see Brent. Um, but he, yeah, he makes amazing, amazing stuff. And uh, today we're pretty fortunate to talk about his current build that he's working on that he hopes to have out, I believe, in 2024. So uh, look for this at a show coming up near you. So Brent's car that he's working on is a 1957 Chevy Bel Air. And... This car is absolutely beautiful. It is, I mean, the 57 Bel Air is one of the sexiest cars ever made. The body lines are perfect. Um, the interior on this car is incredible. It's probably one of my favorite um, interiors of any vehicle ever made. Uh, GM really had it figured out back then. And Brent's taking it to the next step. So Brent's real big on um, chassis fabrication. I mean, the guy, his frames are works of art. And if you've been around the low riding game for five minutes, um, you've heard of a pit bull frame. And this one has a very unique pit bull frame. Uh, being that it's a Tri-5, the Tri-5 Chevrolet suspension stuff's a little bit unique. It's It looks like a 64, you know, 58 to 64 stuff, but it's not, it's, it's totally different. And Brent has taken it to the next level. Uh, looking at the frame itself, I mean, just the fabrication he's done on this thing and the way he's incorporated one of his pit bull rear ends with the uh, special wishbone is absolutely amazing. I've never seen anything like this. It's, it truly is a work of art and very unique for any Tri-5 Chevrolet. Um, now, you know, Brent's known to put things on the bumper and this car's gonna be no different. Uh, look at this picture here in this driveway. Brent's showing you what he's all about. And make no mistake, this is going to be a big inch uh, street car. So I look forward to seeing this thing in the future. I look forward to seeing this at the shows and uh, seeing what Brent can do with it as he puts miles on the car and uh, takes it out for its first public outings. So give Brent a follow, look him up. Uh, he has a Pitbull Hydraulics Facebook group, which is awesome, full of technical stuff. And uh, uh, Brent's a great guy to talk to. He's very knowledgeable and uh, very friendly and helpful. So look him up. Uh, Brent, thank you so much for being this episode's Builder Spotlight. And again, we can't wait to see this car in the future. So take care. God bless. Now let's get on to today's episode, Welding and Plasma Cutting 101. All right, so today's episode, we're finally gonna talk about some welding and plasma cutting on the channel. 
this has been a long time coming. I should have addressed this quite some time ago, but to be quite honest with you, it wasn't until recently that I started getting a lot of questions about the MIG welding and plasma cutting side of how to get started on a project. All right, so here's just some of the basic hand tools and safety gear that you're gonna need when you guys go to get started doing this at home. Uh, got just a broad overview. It's not everything, but it's enough to get you started so you can get uh, familiar with the lingo and understand these things when it's time to start purchasing them. First and foremost, gloves. Uh, there's many different types. You have the cotton or nylon. You also have uh, MIG specific gloves and you have stick welding gloves. Now, I'm not going to tell you what glove to use and not use, but I will tell you this. Not all gloves are created the same. These are not exactly fireproof. Oh, hey, fire marshal Bill, your finger's on fire! Yeah, it's getting That's nothing! I've got fire so many times I can't even feel it anymore. <laughs> uh, and stick welding gloves are a little big and bulky, so you may not want to use those when it comes to welding for the first time. Uh, next is a skull cap. You do not have to have a skull cap, but they're nice to have, um, especially if you're doing a lot of overhead welding or, you know, like laying under a car doing an exhaust kind of thing. Uh, next would be what's known as whelpers. So whelpers are essentially MIG welding pliers. These things are specialized for MIG welding. They're really cheap, guys. They're only like 10 or 15 bucks at your local welding supply store or Harbor Freight. Uh, but they're designed specifically for MIG welding. So keep that in mind when you have to trim the wire and, and change out the tips. Next is the wire itself. <clears throat> so there's many different suppliers, many different kinds of welding. This is just two of the basics that we're going to talk about. So this happens to be the Vulcan Harbor Freight brand. Um, this happens to be, I believe I got this from Harbor Freight as well. Uh, but you can also get these at um, like your big box store like Lowe's or Home Depot. So the difference here is this is a two pound spool. This is an 11 pound spool. Over time, if you get to do enough welding, like you're gonna do a frame or you're gonna um, you know, replace an entire floor pan, you're gonna use a lot of weld wire. So I would consider upgrading to the larger uh, spool wire if you know you have a lot of welding that you're gonna need to do. Uh, something else to note is every box should have the specifics that come with the welding wire. Like, uh, you know, the ER70S tells me that it's mild steel. Uh, the 0.025 tells me the diameter of the wire. And uh, there's going to be some other things that, that it's going to tell you, like the applications that it's for. So just keep that in mind, guys. Do your homework. Make sure you're getting the right product when it comes time to do welding. Uh, next is going to be consumables. So consumables are anything that you have to use that are going to be replaced. Uh, an example of that would be like a contact tip. A contact tip is what you the wire shoots out of uh, when you're MIG welding. These have to be replaced from time to time and they do go bad. So don't think that just having one tip is going to uh, last your entire project. You're probably going to have to get uh, you know a few packs of those. So something to keep in mind. Uh, we'll talk about more about this when we get over to the actual welder itself, but this is a drive roll. So this is something you change out when you need to change the diameter of what it is that you're welding. This particular one happens to be 30 thousandths or 45 thousandths. So I'll go over you know more about that in detail here in just a few moments. Uh, so these are just some of the really basic things that you need uh, when getting starting in welding. Oh, and one thing I almost forgot, uh, soapstone. Soapstone's your friend. If you've never used this stuff, pick it up. You can get it at Harbor Freight cheap, like five sticks for, I don't know, two bucks. Um, it's something that you can mark on the steel and then wipe off. And uh, it's a, a pretty good visual guide when you're welding and you have your helmet on. So now let's talk about the helmet itself. All right, so my helmet um, is an ESOB helmet. Now, this is one of the fancier ones that you can buy. Uh, you do not need, obviously, one that is like super duper fancy, but this is just what I use. This is an, what's considered an auto darkening. Now, there is a non-auto dark, which is your, is your traditional old school helmet, which would look something like that guy right there. Um, either one will do the job. It just depends on you know personal preference and, of course, your budget. Um, Something to consider with auto dark is if you're 
new to welding and you're not sure about like how to get started, uh, starting and stopping in one place, something like this will help you uh, do that. Now, when it comes to the machine side of things, there's a couple things we should talk about. We should talk about our, uh, when it comes to brands, I'm not super specific brand loyalty, uh, but Lincoln has served me well. I've had this welder for almost 20 years, and uh, it's never skipped a beat. It's always been really great. Now, this particular machine is 110, uh, or excuse me, 120 volt, um, and it is uh, it uses welding gas, so it is not a flux core machine. Even though it can be set up for flux core, I choose not to do that. So that's one of the most common questions I get, guys, is can I weld... Uh, do my low rider project with flux core? The answer to that is yes, you can. But again, it just comes down to personal preference. Flux core is messy. Uh, it puts off a lot of smoke. You got a chip slag. Um, there's, you know, just like anything else, there's drawbacks to it. But there's also the plus side. It's a little bit cheaper. Um, you don't have to have the welding gas. So we'll talk more about the welding gas in a minute. But in this particular instance, I'm using just a basic uh, Lincoln Electric. This is the Pro MIG uh, 140 machine. I purchased this at Lowe's, like I said, almost 20 years ago. Um, and this is the 120 volt uh, unit. So yeah, very basic guys. Uh, so when it comes to welding gas, what am I using? I am using 7525 shielding gas. So that's 75% argon, 25% carbon dioxide. Now, one thing you'll notice that's probably a little bit different that you're not used to is this right here. So I'm using a, a different style uh, gauge. This is one that I use mostly on my TIG welder, but I do use it on my MIG machine. Uh, you don't have to have this fancy gauge. It'll come with the two gauges when you buy this actual machine. Um, but if you want a flow meter, which is actually what this is called, this is what they look like. And you can get these on, hell, I think Amazon for 25 bucks or less. Um, so this is just a very basic setup. This is what I've built my entire car with uh, when it comes to the welding side of things. So the question I get all the time is, should I have a 240 volt setup uh, at home to do this kind of work? And, you know, I've always told everybody, anything I say on this channel is not the gospel, okay? But it's enough to get you started and you can learn from it and learn what works best for you. So I built my entire car thus far with this. It's a 120 volt setup, and uh, it's, it's done everything that I've needed to do to get this to this point. So that's, that includes my entire frame wrap, my upper and lower control arms. That's everything, guys, so something to keep in mind. Uh, plasma cutter we'll go over in just a few moments. Uh, I wanna kinda focus on the welder itself. So. What are we looking at here? Pro Mig 140. Uh, you guys will notice I've got this machine maxed out on the voltage and about 50% on uh, the wire speed. Now, a lot of that's gonna come down to skill. And some guys are gonna argue with me about what I'm about to say, but I really don't care. It's just my personal opinion. Um, having this kind of equipment is great, you know, but if you handed me a machine that was 30 years old, and not a name brand product, I could produce the same kind of welds uh, with that machine as this one. So the point I'm trying to make is that it comes down to your technique. You're gonna have to practice. You're gonna have to uh, spend some time in the garage, you know, land some passes. I had an instructor at school tell me, when you put down five miles of weld wire, you'll be okay. I think there's a lot of truth to that statement. Uh, welding that much, trying to better your technique, better your skill level is the truth. Because when I first started doing this stuff and I went to school, I was very fortunate that I got to go to Hobart uh, here in Ohio. And my first welds were horrible, nothing to write home about, um, just because I simply didn't know. So over time, I've built that technique. Um, and now every time I weld, it's trying to obtain perfection, trying to make the next weld the perfect weld. So don't expect and get discouraged when you start welding at home and you got your machine out and you've spent, you know, a thousand bucks and you're going, oh my God, my welds look like crap. That's okay. It just takes time, but don't give up. Keep, keep going. Um, and get yourself a good grinder because let's be honest, uh, to be a good welder, you'll probably be a, a good grinder first. So 
no shame in that. So just uh, keep your nose down and keep on going and, and lay that perfect bead every time. So this machine is very basic when it comes to the actual handle portion, uh, your torch, I mean. So you got a contact tip. This is called a nozzle. Um, and then you've got your ground. And the bones of the machine are what we're gonna talk about next. You know, what do these things look like inside? What should I be concerned about? Now, I've talked about this several times on the channel, so those of you that's been around for a while, this is uh, some repeat info, but stick with me, okay? Every machine should have one of these on the inside. It's not gonna look exactly like this, but it's enough uh, to get you started. And that's what I always tell everybody. This, this here isn't the gospel. It's just a guideline to get you going on the machine. But it's gonna help you out with some super uh, good, um, you know, some lessons to learn here. Like, this one doesn't use shielding gas, so this would be flux core, uh, 7525 or 100%. And then, of course, you got options for aluminum. I don't use that on this machine, um, but that's a whole other video in itself. Then it's going to show you some weld techniques, just very basic stuff, and then a guideline on thicknesses and how you should set your machine up um, when it comes to the settings. Now... I'm currently running uh, one of those big 11 pound spools um, just because that's I go through a lot of this stuff, okay? Now, one thing you'll notice here, there's that dry roll that I was talking about earlier. Um, this is something that you wanna change when you change the diameter of your wire, okay? Your machine should have two or three of these for different diameters. Um, if not, they can be purchased separ separately from pretty much any welding supply uh, place. Uh, so what's going on in there is pretty straightforward. Uh, nothing that you can't do at home. Now, the one takeaway from a machine, when you're out shopping or you're looking on Marketplace or any box store or whatever it is that you're looking at, there's a couple things I want you to consider. If you're buying a used setup like this and the seller won't let you try it first, walk away. Don't buy it. Always try out the machine uh, if somebody wants to meet you in a parking lot and you don't have a power supply to try it out, don't buy it. That's just my personal opinion. Some of you may not agree with that. That's okay. That's just how I feel about it. Next, when buying a machine, the cost is all over the place. And a big factor of that is the duty cycle. The duty cycle of each machine is different. And the duty cycle, basically in a nutshell, is how many minutes can I keep this machine running at full capacity, uh, how many minutes can I run continuous out of 10, basically? This machine is a 60% duty cycle. So, you know, they sell them 20, 40, 60. Um, and then when you step up to 240 volt, of course, the duty cycle can go all the way up to 100%. And I always recommend buy the highest duty cycle that you can afford because you're going to keep this machine for a very long time and it's gonna be worth it to spend the couple extra bucks when it comes to that. So a lot to keep in mind there. Okay, next thing I wanna talk about real quick, and I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on it. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, and it's not something that's gonna change a whole lot. I have a dedicated welding circuit in my garage. This is a 120 volt circuit that I've ran myself. Um, that is a dedicated circuit for just my welder and just the plasma cutter. Uh, it doesn't share anything uh, with anything else in the house. So, you know, if you're going to be running a machine like this, um, which is a 20 amp, you know, you don't want to wire something that's running to like, say, a coffee pot or a toaster oven or a microwave or, you know, somebody's using the hairdryer in the house because it's going to blow that circuit. If you have the ability to run a dedicated circuit, do that. Okay. And I know not everybody can do that, um, but... It, I always recommend try to do that if you can. So again, dedicated welding circuit, 120 volts, and that's pretty much it, straightforward. Same thing with the 240 volt. Uh, you would want a dedicated circuit if you know you're gonna be welding a lot in your home garage and uh, you don't really want something that's running off another power source somewhere else in the house. So just food for thought when you're setting up for your welder. Okay, so next let's talk about the uh, plasma cutter itself. Uh, again, this is a very, very basic unit. This happens to be the Jags brand, uh, Cut 40. It's very similar to like your Eastwood or your Harbor Freight uh, products. 
um, both in design and function. It's they're virtually the same. Um, this this machine was two hundred and gosh, I can't remember two sixty. I think it's probably closer to three hundred now, just because of inflation and all that crap. But the takeaways for this machine, you guys have seen me use this. You just saw me do uh, use this on the floor pan. And to be quite honest, that's where I got a lot of the questions from. Uh, this machine is a 110 or a 220 unit, so that's really unique. Um, if you have the ability to get one that does both, go ahead and pick it up. It's no big deal. But that's kind of the beauty of this machine is you can do the 240 volt. Uh, next, this particular machine, I've got it currently running off 20 amps. So that would be for my uh, dedicated welding circuit that we just talked about. Um, this machine, i uh, be 100% honest with you, it's kind of finicky, uh, mostly because the um, torch head itself is kind of weird, like the buttons on the back side versus a trigger pull, which um, from what I've read online, you can actually change these out to the trigger pull, like the Eastwood version or the Harbor Freight version. Um, this just happens to be something that Jake's has. But the basics are all the same. Uh, it uses consumables, so it would be like your cutting tip um, and then on the inside it has um, a little cutting tip with a ceramic cup and then you have your outside ceramic cup. I'm not going to spend the whole time taking this apart and showing you every little piece of it because your machine may be set up just a little different. But the basics are all the same. Um, and then of course you have your ground. So you have to have a ground when you're plasma cutting because basically what you're doing is you're completing a circuit. So um, let's say this would be your positive, this would be your negative. And that's kind of how that works. The last thing that you're going to need for this, uh, for any plasma cutter, is compressed air. So uh, I don't remember off the top of my head the recommendations for PSI for this. I want to say it uses between 60 and 80 PSI to the machine, but it puts out a pretty low volume through the actual cutting head, which is, I think, maybe 6 to 10 PSI. Guys, don't quote me on that. I'm just trying to remember off the top of my head. Um, but the point is, is you get a higher volume in the machine and a lower volume out of the head itself. Now, that's not saying they're all going to be that way. That's just how this one is. Um, if you go buy a bigger, you know, $3,000 machine that's 240 volt or whatever, it's, it's settings are going to be a little bit different. So just keep that in mind. I bought this because of the price point. Plus it was 110, uh, 120 volt compatible. Um, so it worked out for me and it's done everything I've needed to do. I cut every single plate for this frame, upper and lower control arms off this machine. So it can be done. So that's, that's one of the things I wanted to talk about and I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time, just real quick. Ain't nobody got time for that. Guys are like, hey, I've been told I can't do this kind of work off 120 volt setup. Um, I need to have 240, blah, 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 blah. No, you don't. That is not true. Um, I, and I've proven that on the channel over the past year, year and a half on these, some of these videos that you guys have seen. So if this is what you can afford, this is what's in your budget, this is what you can use at home, then that's where you start. Do what you can with what you got. All right, guys, here we go. Welding 101 MIG Welding Basics. Uh, I've tried to lay this out as um, user-friendly as I possibly can. Again, my favorite saying in the world, this is not the gospel. If you can take anything away from this and it helps you, then we're doing something good. So here's the basics, okay? Follow me as best you can. Um, we're gonna do MIG welding, which is metal inert gas. So we're using a solid core wire, not flux core, solid core. Our shielding gas is gonna be a 75, 25% mixture. Uh, there is one exception to that. If you're doing stainless welding, uh, you would want to use 100% argon or uh, aluminum. You want to use 100% argon. So, but that's a whole other topic. Today, we're just going to focus on uh, carbon steel. Okay, consumables. We, we that's that word again. We were talking about earlier. Consumables. That's things you're going to use constantly, frequently, and you got to replace them over time. Now, there are a couple options that we'll talk about. So, um, just bear with me. First one is obviously the wire and your shielding gas. You're gonna use that stuff. It's gonna to have to be replaced over time, okay? Next thing is contact tip, the nozzle, and then of course your PPE or your personal protective equipment. 
Um, that would be safety glasses, gloves, uh, well jacket, um, lenses for your helmet. Uh, anything like that you're going to have to replace over time. It's just part of the nature of the beast, you know. Contact tip, again, we talked about that earlier because you're, you're going to burn those up. So go ahead and get you a pack of 10 when you get started. Uh, nozzle, you won't have to replace as much. Um, I think it's been probably five years since I put a nozzle on my machine. So those last quite a long time. But nevertheless, you will have to replace it at some time. Optional, nozzle dip. A uh, nozzle dip is something that you can actually dip the tip of the nozzle into to prevent weld splatter from sticking to it. Uh, again, that's just an option. You don't have to have that. Um, do, do your homework about that. Look on YouTube, search uh, nozzle dip. They also make a nozzle spray that you can spray on your um, workpiece and it won't let slatter build up and stick to um, your workpiece. Now, some make machine basics. When we set our gas flow, which is the uh, gas meter that's on the side for your machine, you're, you want to set it between 15 and 20 CFMs. Uh, that's kind of the sweet spot. Don't go below. Don't really go too uh, much higher than that. Um, below the 15, and you may you know you risk having incomplete gas coverage. Above the 20, and what actually happens is you're creating a vortex where the gas comes out of the nozzle. And it's so much pressure that it can actually blow the shielding gas away from the workpiece. Um, I've seen high speed magnification of that happening. And it's pretty wild. It looks like a little tornado. But anyways, between 15 and 20 is the sweet spot. Wire speed and voltage. Now, this will depend on the thickness of the base metal. That's yes and no. Um, I always tell people that because if I'm welding something that's uh, let's say, you know, I'm going to fix a fender and that might be like 18 gauge or 20 gauge. Uh, I may not want to set my machine at fully maxed out. I may want to back the settings off a little bit. Um, but you'll notice over time as you get more comfortable with your sh machine and more experience under your belt that you can almost do every job without really fussing with the settings too much. At least um, in my experience, that's where I'm at with my skill set and skill level. So... Uh, depends on the thickness of the base metal. Uh, any metal with a, with a thickness over a quarter inch requires multiple weld passes. So I always tell people this because like, let's say, you know, you're doing your frame, you're reinforcing your frame, you're using 3 16 plate. Um, there's going to be some gaps that aren't exactly perfect. Okay. And if you're trying to fill uh, a gap that's, you know, quarter inch or larger, if you can fit multiple weld passes within that joint, that's probably your best bet. Whether it be, you know, two overlapping or you have your, your root, which is your first pass, and then two cover fill passes. Um, we'll go over the, more of that here in just a minute. So keep that in mind. Don't try to, don't try to stretch that weld out to fill that weld joint if uh, you can't get it in the first shot. Just because um, a couple different things can happen and you don't want to... You know short yourself when it comes to filling that weld joint so keep that in mind uh, base metal prep so there's many different types of weld joints you got a butt joint you got a lap joint open root joint plug weld and a rosette weld again these are these things are just for the people at home who have messaged me on you know Facebook or Instagram or YouTube and said hey how do I get started what do I need to do I, I just don't even know where to begin Butt joint is just as it sounds. You have two pieces of metal that are butting together. Um, when you go to weld a butt joint, you got to be careful about that because if you're if you have two pieces of metal together and you go to weld, say the top side or the bottom side, what's happening is you're not getting like let's say this is the top side. You're not really getting any penetration down here if this is a really thick piece of metal. Well, you always left me satisfied and smiling, so. That's what she said. <laughs> Michael. <laughs> Michael. <laughs> Michael, please. Serious. Please. Serious. So what you want to do in that scenario is bevel that weld joint. That way you're filling this whole area with weld while also filling the root pass and burning that in. Um, that's something that you I've used on just about everything with this car thus far. Now, when it comes to belt wel butt welding like sheet metal, do I want to put um, a bevel on it? Not always. If it's something really, really thin, you're, you're just going to burn right through it anyways. But when it comes to like, 
you know, I'm doing something that's an eighth inch or three sixteenths or a quarter. Uh, it's going to help to put that bevel in there and fill that well joint. Lap joint, just as it sounds, you got two overlapping pieces of metal. Um, now, one thing you can do, like let's say we wanted to, uh, to weld these corners, you can actually bevel these plates back. That way you're getting weld, uh, weld wire inside the joint and filling um, that opening versus uh, just welding that 90 degree right there and having no penetration on the inside of your weld joint. Uh, open root joint. Now, what a root is, a root is the base of where your weld's gonna be. Okay, you know, a butt joint, they're touching. Open root, there's a small little gap between the plates. Uh, typically, it's about three times the diameter of your weld wire, but that's, that's not always the case. It, you know, depending on what your project is, it may be smaller, it may be a larger opening. Uh, but open root joint is basically where you got the gap between the plates and you're going to do the uh, cover, the fill and the root all in one pass. Now something to take note, just like the butt joint, you can actually bevel these plates for more weld and you can put what's called a land. So anytime you have a sharp edge, um, the metal will tend to burn out and when you deposit the weld wire, it will want to uh, droop down. Now if you put a, what's called a land where you basically just put a flat grind on that edge, it will actually cause that weld to, to just kind of hang there and fill that weld joint without doing uh, the drooping. So that would be like uh, a concave. That's con In welding, in MIG welding, you have what's called convex and concave. Uh, convex, proud, concave, sagging. So something to keep in mind when you're doing an open root joint. Uh, last is plug weld or a rosette weld. Um, you don't really hear this talked about too much, but basically the gist of it is um, guys will ask me, hey, I'm welding plates to my frame, doing a frame reinforcement. Is it better for me to drill holes down that plate and fill those with a rosette weld or a plug weld? And the answer is it's just, it's up to you. Um, some people prefer to have those, you know, holes down the side to make sure those plates are attached in several, several areas. Um, other people just rely on the corner joints to, uh, to fully, you know, weld those up. So ultimately it's up to you, but a plug weld is basically like, let's say I drilled a hole through this plate and this plate, that's where I'm plug welding that hole. And you're going to see in an upcoming episode, when I go to do the floor pans, there's going to be a lot of plug welds. So, uh, we'll go over that more in depth then. Rosette weld is, um, I just have a hole that I need to fill and, Basically, you're, walk, you're working in a circular motion with the weld wire. Um, I don't see that very much on what I'm doing thus far, um, but you never know. Uh, an actual an example of the rosette weld may be like uh, if you're doing, if you're upgrading your ball joints to like a G-body ball joint. Um, your stock Impala has three holes and the G-body is a four hole or a metric is a four hole. Uh, so you'll want to plug weld or rosette weld those three original holes and drill out the four for the G-body ball joints. So that's something to consider when it, come, when it comes time for plug weld or rosette weld. Okay, so that's pretty much going to cover this part of the welding basics, MIG welding 101. Now let's go to some more advanced topics. So one of the first things we want to talk about is our power source. So we're using a 120 volt power source, just like I mentioned earlier. In this case, I'm using a direct current electronegative, which something to understand is if you buy a machine, um, let's say you're buying it used and somebody used it for flux core, but you're able to weld with gas, then you'll need to reverse the polarity. So you have electronegative and then what's known as electropositive. Be sure to read the owner's manual of any machine that you get to understand what uh, polarity you need for your machine at home. Uh, next is 7525, we talked about that, the 15 and 20 CFM on your gas flow. Uh, one exception is like Trimix and Argon, 100% uh, Argon, you'll want to use that on like stainless, um, aluminum, stuff like that. So familiarize with these terms when you go to purchase your weld gas. Remember, we're using a 75-25 mix, not 100%, okay? 
Um, metals to avoid welding, galvanized steel, and duct iron. I always tell people be careful about this, especially with the galvanized steel because it has a galvanized coating, which is, uh, it off gases when it's heated up and burned and it becomes poison. So try to avoid the galvanized steel. Can you weld galvanized steel? Yes, you can, but try to avoid it if you can. Ductile iron, the big takeaway here is um, ductile iron has surface cracks that you can't see without uh, an x-ray and it has cracks below the surface of the weld joint that you would need to use dye penetrant or an x-ray. Um, now ductile iron is different than like a cast iron block, like an engine block, but when you have a welder at home and people find out about it, you're going to make friends. People are going to want you to weld stuff. So I just want you to be careful, familiarize with these things, okay? Um, let someone else do this, a professional, uh, someone who has the equipment to do it properly and safely. Uh, next, if you take anything from this at all, make sure it's this, work angle versus travel angle. Not everything can be a perfect 45, I understand that. Uh, but if you can, try to use that 45 technique as often as you can. Uh, I understand you're laying on your back underneath your car and you're trying to weld something, it may not be a perfect 45. And what I mean by the perfect 45 is that, let's say this is my torch head for my weld wire. I wanna put that in that joint in about 45 and 45, okay? You don't wanna to go too great or too shallow because then you're directing your shielding gas away from the weld um, puddle, and you don't wanna do that at all costs, okay? Welding techniques, pretty straightforward. This is gonna be a hands-on thing. You're just gonna to have to put you know, the weld to the metal. That's, that's the best way I can explain it. Uh, you have what's known as a cursive E, which um, presents that dime look, hashtag dime slayer. You know who you are out there. Um, then you have what's called a crescent moon, and this is something I'm not even going to talk about. This is the fancy stuff, really, that you see on TikTok. The guys with the TIG welding and making, like, the herringbone passes and stuff. That's, that's a whole other topic in itself. Shielding gas, what it's doing, it's actually creating an atmosphere around the weld, okay? Keeping oxygen away from the weld. So just kind of explaining with these techniques, um, you don't want to have, like with the 45 and 45, you don't want to be too great in either direction. Try to split that joint as evenly as possible, okay? Uh, last but not least, dissimilar metals. Can I weld carbon steel to stainless steel? Yep. Can I weld stainless steel to carbon steel? Yep. Do you always want to? No. If you have a project that's stainless steel, you need to keep it stainless steel because anytime you introduce carbon into the stainless steel, that's going to be a joint that will rust out over time. Um, so just keep that in mind, guys, if you're working on something like your trim or uh, headers or something that you're working on for your project that is stainless steel, keep it 100% stainless steel and try not to mix the metals. So that's just a broad overview, guys, of all this stuff. I hope it helps someone understand what I'm talking about during this episode. I've got just a couple more things I want to show you, uh, answer a couple questions, and then I'll cut you loose. So hang tight. All right, guys, last but not least, when it comes to the welding stuff, there's a couple things I want to explain. Uh, this hopefully will answer Two of the questions I got recently based off the last uh, couple videos. First one is, Billy, I'm welding uh, in a straight line, but I noticed that after a while I start to dive off of my weld joint. What's one way that I can help eliminate that problem? This is really, really simple. This is known as soapstone. Now let's say I have to weld this joint right here, this 90 degree weld joint, and I'm running, 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 and then I start to drop off. Uh, either because I'm having trouble seeing in my helmet or I'm just not that experienced and I haven't quite developed uh, my technique. Uh, a good teaching aid for that to help you make straight lines and something you can still see in your helmet is soapstone. You can actually take this soapstone, split that joint 45 and 45, and draw you two perfect lines. So now, if you're welding inside this joint, you'll be able to see that line. And, and when you're getting close to the line, you can say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm too close, I need to move back up. You can't always do this, but this is a good way to get started and a good way to practice. So, two lines across your workpiece, you can weld that weld joint and stay within those lines. Last but not least, uh, 
I need to fill a hole. I, I don't have, I, let's say the hole is open on the backside and it's a larger hole, but I don't want to weld a piece of steel to it. How can I fill that hole? That's a great question. Uh, you can use copper. So this is an old part of a bus bar. Uh, same with this. These came from a power supply. But I always tell people you don't have to go find bus bar pieces. Go to like Lowe's or Home Depot and buy like a one inch or two inch copper uh, pipe cap in the plumbing section. And basically the way this works is, let's say I have um, one of these holes right here and I want to fill one of those holes. You can actually back this hole with copper and weld right over top of that hole and then this won't stick to the steel because when what in welding and you know metallurgy and chemistry you have what's called ferrous and non-ferrous or magnetic and non-magnetic because these are mixed metals they won't stick together so i can literally you know i can literally put this right underneath that hole weld that hole up and then this will pull off and it'll be comp completely flat on the back side so something to consider um, when you're welding your rosette or plug welds and you have an open hole that you need to fill. So I hope that explains that. Okay, so last but not least is uh, one of the questions I got from the last video when I was talking about the uh, convertible body mounts. So someone asked me, what's the part number for the cage nut that you used and where did you buy it at? So, I purchased these through Restoration World, which is in Huber Heights, Ohio, off of Route 70. Um, RestoWorld.com, I believe is their website. Look them up. Uh, the part number, U275. And this is a body mount cage nut, 7 16 inch dash 14. So 14 is the thread pitch, how, you know, the threads that you're using. Um, this is what I use for the cage nut. Pretty self-explanatory. U275 is the part number. Give them a call, purchase your cage nuts there, and tell them Gym City Welding sent you. All right, so that's going to wrap up this episode of Gym City Welding. I want to thank you for sticking through this long video, and hopefully you learned something from it and can take something with you out in your garage for that project you're working on. Uh, next episode, most likely we're still going to be working on the floor a little bit and uh, just getting ready to pull the doghouse and pull the body off the frame. So all that more on the next episode, so please stay tuned. Uh, please like, share, subscribe, spread the message of what I'm doing here at Gym City Welding. And if you know somebody that this information can help, please let them know about it. Uh, take care. We'll see you next time. God bless. Have a great week.